Hi, my name's Amy and I'm the Exhibitions and Interpretation Officer at Elmbridge Museum. You're watching the Curator's Talk for Elmbridge Museum's Objects of Empire exhibition, which has added new interpretations to a selection of items in our collection to uncover the many previously hidden links to the British Empire in our borough's history. You can view the online exhibition, take a look at our recommended book list and find the local Empire Trail on our website. For our curator's talk today, I'm going to be discussing empire and museums with Dr. Alison Smith. Alison is currently chief curator at the National Portrait Gallery, where she manages collection acquisitions, temporary displays and interpretation. Alison was formerly the curator of 19th century British art at Tate Britain. It was here that she oversaw the installation of the Tate's Artist and Empire exhibition in 2015, for which she also edited an accompanying book of the same name. Thank you so much for joining me, Alison. Um, to start off with, could you please just provide um, an outline of the Artist and Empire exhibition, maybe some details of what was included uh, and the general message and purpose of the exhibition? Okay, it's what the um, Artist and Empire exhibition, which took place at Tate Britain in 2015, was the first large scale exhibition um, ever presented about art made in response to the British Empire and to um, the conditions established um, by it. Um, it was quite an unusual exhibition and that previous exhibitions on the subject, because it's such a huge subject, previous exhibitions had tended to focus on a particular artist or a particular place in the world. This had a much broader, much wider perspective in that it wanted to show that how um, art was affected and influenced by the experiences and conditions of empire, but also about how art itself has influenced the way we perceive um, the empire at various stages of its existence. And we also wanted to show that um, near the present day, how have artists have used um, their art and art making to challenge and question um, the whole sort of concept of empire. So it's a really ambitious, wide-ranging um, project and I think because it was so sort of um, vast in its scope we decided quite early on to take a very focused approach and to look at the legacy of empire as represented by works in British collections. So it's really about art making and we took a very broad Def, we do try art in a very broad way. So um, it's about visual art and visual culture. And we didn't really distinguish between say high art and other forms of art making such as maps, topographical drawings, architectural drawings, we included history paintings, portraits, um, sculptures. Just for you to show how art was really sort of, you know, um, a key role in this nexus really of exchange um, and how these objects um, told stories about assimilation, rejection, um, um, conquest, how it played out in a number of different um, ways. It was such an you know, ambitious, complicated project. We felt it was quite important, again this is quite controversial to say, to be non-didactic and to try and maintain a balanced perspective throughout. It's a very emotive subject, people have made you know, very strong views on it, but um, with the idea was to try and let the objects speak for themselves about these histories, even if the objects compare, you know, projected different points of view or different um, perspectives. Great, thank you so much. That's a really great overview. Just moving on to preparing for the exhibition, what was your role specifically um, throughout the process of creating the Artists and Empire exhibition? Um, what was your kind of main input into, into that? So I think as with you know, any exhibition, you know, the, sort of the lead curator is really like a sort of director or producer. You have to orchestrate the whole thing. So I worked with a group of curators at Tate who were some sort of new specialists in their own, own areas. And so really we were setting up meetings, discussion groups. We invited, we invited external consultants in to talk about areas where we didn't have a particular knowledge or um, experience. Also liaising with other departments. As acting as an ambassador or advocate for the project and pe winning people over to it. And then also sort of, you know, um, directing the loan negotiations as well. So I think the first year on the project was really deciding the parameters 
of the exhibition, the themes, the structure of the exhibition, and then digging down into the content. And that required visiting quite a few collections across the UK and then having conversations with directors and curators about works in their collection, drawing on their expertise, and then gradually building up a loan request list, then sending out those loan request letters, responding to them, and then just gradually, very slowly, sort of um, shaping the exhibition. And then once you had that sort of shape and the content, it was then working on the interpretation in each of the separate sections, the interpretation in the, in the gallery space itself, and also the accompanying publication, which provided a lot more context than we could allow for you know, in the physical space of the exhibition itself. I find it really interesting when you were talking about um, arranging loans and, and going and viewing objects. That must have been amazing. Um, and I just wondered, um, because you mentioned about, you know, the fact there were strong views and, and letting the objects speak for themselves. Was there a criteria as in there needs to be this number of um, objects which are supportive of empire and this number which are you know showing it in a different light um, how did you make those decisions yes that and that was there was a lot of discussion around that and I um, mean some people within the organization felt you needed more voices speaking out in opposition or critiquing empire that you didn't want it to be seen as an exercise that actually promoted the ideology of empire so um again selecting the, the, the objects and again it was um having to work with the material available sometimes the works one really wanted to present that particular perspective just weren't there we weren't there in the in, in the uk or we weren't they were so large we weren't able to accommodate them in the space available so those were all challenges but the other thing was you know, we're having to think about the interpretation and how the objects could be layered and how through you know, what in one painting you can um convey or relay different perspectives on a subject and um at one point there was quite a discussion about should we include works by contemporary artists in the historical spaces or should we separate them out? And that discussion went on for quite a few months, actually, before we decided it was better to actually separate them out because you could end up with a position where all the historical work could just be dismissed by the contemporary works. The contemporary works had the moral high ground. We're speaking from the present, we know better these people were just didn't, didn't know better in the, in, the, in the past, or they were completely brainwashed by this ideology. So that's why we thought you did need some sense of chronology in the exhibition, just to provide the, the, the context. Great, thank you. That's, that's interesting in the context of um, objects of empire as well, because I know that um, what I've tried to do online is use, um, it's not obviously the same as, you know, using contemporary artists, but um, I've tried to put a few um, quotes from authors and public figures um, who have written on empire or spoken on empire, um, just to kind of add either context or add a bit of opinion and a bit of contemporary interpretation. I didn't want it to all just be my interpretation, um, if you see what I mean, and, and have some kind of modern cultural implication as well. Um, so I think it's a good way of, of doing that. Yes, so, we, so that's why I thought it's very important it went up to the present day rather yeah. than there was one discussion at some point, should it end in the 1960s? Then the question was, well, when did empire end? It's still mm. you new. Know, being played out today, which is why we decided to take it right through to the present. But there were quite a few discussions about, you know, what point do you conclude this um, exhibition? And another question was, can you be neutral? Some people were saying within the organisation, you know, as you are curators, you're representing you know, the Tate, we have to have a stance on this and no one can be neutral on such a sort of you know, um, controversial subject. So that was very difficult. But then you felt if you did go down that sort of that line, it could end up being very emotive one-sided and you could alienate sections of the, you know, the broad audience you wanted to attract. So it's very, it's very, very difficult, it's very, it's very delicate, um, yeah. but a lot of it, it depends on the selection of objects and maybe with hindsight, we, we weren't lucky in all the loans, the British Museum weren't able to lend at that time, so a lot of the works we wanted by sort of new in, indigenous artists um, were not available, but we were lucky in, in securing support from the Cambridge Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology and other places to redress the unbalance. Um, 
but some people felt the perspective was too much on the side of you know, British artists overseas rather than artists from other cultures respond responding. Um, though that did come in the second half of the exhibition. I know that you've touched on negative responses to the exhibition, um, but was there anything specific either within the Tate or from audiences that was um, negative or hesitant um, when the kind of topic came out and, and the exhibition began? Oh, I thought we had all sorts of um, comments. Um, it's quite difficult for me of calling them all, but um, I think a subject like this, you can't, there's no way everyone's going to say, oh, this is wonderful, this is the answer to everything. Um, the criticisms were, went from extremes. Um, so some people felt it was um, rather painfully earnest, trying to um, be too apologetic for Britain's imperial past. Some, another interesting thing was it being held at the Tate. The Tate is an art gallery. It's different from, say, the National Portrait Gallery, where I work at the moment, which is about history and biography. So the exhibitions we put on at the MPG, the sort of um, what the quality of the art or the aesthetics is not so important as the history or the biography or the stories. Was at the Tate, it's the aesthetic considerations are paramount. So some people felt it was an exhibition full of really bad art or by second-rate artists, and therefore it's not really a proper, you know, in inverted commas, art exhibition. So some people thought, well, this awful, risable objects, you know, how can you call this um, art? And other people felt it was too safe, too restrained, too tasteful, um, and, um, and in that sense, it was almost acting as a kind of propaganda for empire, making it look beautiful. You know, a lot of attention was given over to the lighting, the colours, to presenting the objects beautifully. And some people felt, well, that sense, you're, you're condoning it. So that was the other extreme of interpretation. Um, some people felt it was a bit non this so-called balanced approach was a bit non-committal and that the curators sort of taken more of a stance on the subject. And um, some people felt the subject was just too complex for an exhibition. We shouldn't even be going on there. And that if to do an exhibition on the subject, it really needs in-depth sort of critical contextualization, which you can't, of course, provide in an exhibition space when you're limited to 100 words per caption or 200 words for an introductory text for a room. Um, some people felt that you're limited in what you can actually communicate through the word, through the, the text, and that's going to lead to misunderstanding or to, um, to, to a bias, or not, you, know, you can't really be truly impartial. So um, those were the kinds of sort of criticisms the exhibition um, re received. I mean, it's quite interesting. I often ask myself, you know, in light of um, Black Lives Matter, um, and you know the recent you know discussions about you know the represent statues in public and works in museums. Could we have staged this exhibition now? It might have been pulled now. I think it's just too difficult a subject. On the other hand, a lot of people are now calling for objects which people take for granted in museums and galleries to be properly contextualised and these hidden histories to be brought to the fore. Yeah, I think that those are all good points as well. Um, in that all of the kind of criticism that you're mentioning is still opening up a discussion on the topic, which is ideal, um, ideally what, you know, any exhibition is going to achieve, whether it's, you know, it's, okay, criticism is, is one thing, but it's still making people talk about the content, um, which I think is always a good outcome. With our objects of empire, that's what I was kind of thinking from the start was, you know, if, if we um, draw on new interpretations of these objects and, and put them in a new light that we haven't considered before, it's it's not trying to broach the whole topic, but it's just trying to start up a discussion and show that these that's are right. other angles. That's what um, we really wanted to do. Yeah. To make it, and then that's why we had some, you know, there's audio points in the exhibition where mm. we invited some, an external commentator to talk about a particular object and to go into it in greater depth and context. And then we had a little sort of new video installation in the foyer space out the outside the exhibition with people like Shami um, Chakrabarti or um, Roy Grossman, people talking about works in the exhibition and bringing their perspective to bear on the subject.
Great, just you. to make it quite clear that it wasn't just you know the group of curators putting this together. It was it was there to invite a discussion and a debate. Yeah. I think that was basically it was very successful. A lot of people said they spent you know over two hours in the exhibition and they came away and they went they were still discussing it. And that's that I think it was successful and that so it sparked a debate which is still yeah. ongoing. Still played out today. Would you say that museums have an obligation to address the issue of empire through their work? Um, and if so, like, wh why? What's your reasoning behind that? Um, I think in this day and age, they certainly um, do. I mean, I think the reason, one of the reasons why it was overlooked in the past, particularly in art contexts, is that, you know, you could say, well, British art didn't have much, didn't show much about the history of um, um, empire. It was really invisible, you know, portraits, landscapes, genre scenes, you know, focus on sort of domestic um, life and that um, it's really the work that the collecting or which took place on the part of ethnologists or soldiers or the work of itinerant traveling artists you know, like Augustus Earl, Thomas Daniel, um, William Simpson who are not household names these were the artists who made their careers through these you know, colonial imperial networks but their works are not regarded as great art say like Turner or Gainsborough or Constable or Pre-Raphaelites for um, example but you could actually say well nowadays that you know, empire, so it's like a, you know, um, it's a thread which runs through everything and it's how you bring those histories to the fore. So you could look at British painting and say, well, look, the pigments artists use came to the country through these trade um, networks. Um, the way people were represented shows certain attitudes. The family who bought this painting made their fortune from plantations in the Caribbean or you know, from the sugar refining business. And you, you can, it, it, it plays out on many different um, levels. I think this is what's starting to happen now. The, you know, the, the, the history, it's not just the straightforward biography or what the subject represents. It's all, you have to unpack it layer by layer. And so I think many museums, I know we're doing this at the Portrait Gallery, we're having to revisit all the entries on sitters. Um, for example, we had one on Colston, with Edward Colston, which had him down as a merchant and philanthropist. We've had to now add that he was you know, involved in the, the slave trade as well. Um, we've had to add that to the biography and then rewrite the entry. So, um, and then also it's the tone of voice when you say that you know, Napier or some other general um, led a heroic campaign. You know, the use of that language is a bit, you can see it seems to be apologetic or celebratory. So one's having to adjust that as well. So it's a big learning curve. I agree totally with you know everything that you've just said. I think that something that I've found um, when doing objects of empire is that even in places where you'd assume there's no link to empire, there often is, um, and it's shown by the number of links within Alfred's local history. Um, so I think that personally, after creating objects of empire and doing all the research and finding out so much, when when you kind of just dig a little bit deeper, um, I'd also be more inclined to like agree with you and say it is an obligation. Um, I think it's certainly something which should be explored and researched before being dismissed completely um, in yeah. museums. And I think from, from my perspective in local history as well, something with um, we've done, or I've just finished with the Objects of Empire exhibition, is the um, Mapping Empire project, um, which is the, the kind of trail around the local area. Um, I found that particularly interesting to research firstly, but also I think there's a lot to be said for showing how empire is really still interwoven in the fabric of the community rather than simply behind the glass in in an exhibition or in objects which are hidden away in a collection um, so from my perspective in, in local history i think that that's also something that is really valuable um, in showing it in our mm -hmm. everyday lives it still exists and it's still in you know architecture and statues and and all sorts of things in the communities um, that are still around What, what was the ongoing legacy of the Artists and Empire exhibition? The legacy can manifest itself in various ways. Through the exhibition, the Tate made a number of important acquisitions. The main one being the Donald Locke, you know, Trophies of Empire, which is a really key work from the, you know, the 60s and um, um, 70s, you know, speaking out against um, empire and the history of um, slavery in the, in the Caribbean. Um, that's a very powerful work. And it's through securing that work from loan, we were able to make contact with the owner and acquire that for the gallery. Um, certain artists came to light, contemporary artists, which the gallery you know, wanted, were interested 
in acquiring works. It brought, also brought you know, works to the attention of other academics, um, scholars, um, students. So I think it really sort of, you know, um, and, that, and how to look at art through the lens of empire. I think that really sort of, you know, caught on. And um, I think it's like passing on a baton to other institutions and individuals that you actually, this is a subject worth addressing. In, it has its challenges and it didn't, it didn't provide all the answers. Um, it's probably the first of what will be in a succession of different um, um, projects, um, which will go on addressing this subject way into the future. And also raising the question about cataloging, interpretation, you know, the, the programmes you um, bring together around exhibitions. So I think it, you know, it had a legacy in, you know, on many different fronts, really. Another thing which perhaps we could learn from this is sharing objects between yeah. collections. I know when we're doing our redisplay at the National Portrait Gallery, um, we want, you know, we're seeking, we are actually seeking you know, portraits or representations of the black sitters going back into history to the Tudor times. So we'll have to borrow from other museums in the UK to convey that, relay that story. So I think if new museums, some, some museums have you know, a surplus of material which is brought back, so maybe they'll be willing to lend. There's also this whole question about restitution as well, which is something you know, we'll have to confront sooner or later. Objects which came into this country as you know, loot or you know, what they call prize at that time. That's something you know, which is being, you know, it's, it's being addressed at the moment and it won't go away. Definitely. And, and I think it will be a gradual change, but hopefully, I mean, even as you say now, things things are gradually changing. I think there's definitely been a shift, a large shift yeah. in attitudes amongst museums over the last few months.